hello welcome again um so today i am going to be talking about chapter 19 in essential cell biology this is the chapter that talks about sexual reproduction and genetics um it's a little bit of a catch-all uh, chapter it has a lot of information from many of the chapters that we've already done uh, and we have talked about them in a lot more detail than we will in this particular chapter but it kind of brings it all together and talks about how many of those processes and systems that we talked about in the past uh, work together when it comes to sexual reproduction and genetic inheritance. Um, so starting off, um, there are two ways that organisms can reproduce. Obviously, you can have the asexual reproduction or sexual reproduction. Many organisms like uh, bacteria, hydra here, um, they reproduce asexually. Um, either through binary fission or budding. These type of uh, reproduction involves um, no changes in the genetic material that is that are present. It's uh, And so the progeny is identical to the parent. So you have essentially clones of the parent as a result of this process. On the other hand, you have sexual reproduction that allows to um, allows for diversification of your population. It allows for genetic variability to be introduced into the system as it um, process, as the process goes on. So that is extremely important for this system. Now here in this image, you see a human egg and you see it's an unfertilized ovum and you see sperm that are trying to penetrate it in order to fertilize it. Well, this type of um, sexual reproduction uh, is what we are going to be talking about today but looking at just this image you would think hey you know the egg is so much larger so it must um, give more to the organism at the end of the day well in fact both of them still contribute almost equally to the genetic character of the offspring the sperm despite its tiny size has all the information that it needs as far as the genetics is concerned um, and all the nuclear material that it needs. So it has the entire chromosome set in, uh, you know, a copy of the entire chromosome set, just like the egg does. The only difference is that the egg also contains cytoplasmic organelles and materials, including the DNA um, that is in the mitochondria, and that increases its contribution just a tiny bit. Not a lot, but just a tiny bit. Um, so there is a little bit more coming from the egg. But overall, it is going to be essentially equal regardless of what it is. So let's talk about how this, uh, this process starts and what exactly is uh, it entails. So in sexual reproduction, you start out with two parents of some sort. Um, Usually these are diploid parents, uh, so you have, you know, an equivalent of mom and a dad, each one containing an entire set of chromosome in duplicate because each one of them will have a set from the mom and dad. So you will have diploid organism. In this uh, example figure, you have just one chromosome set. So there's one homologous pair of chromosomes in the mom and one homologous pair of uh, chromosome in the dad. And through the process of meiosis, the gamete forming cells, the germ cells that is, will produce gametes. These gametes would be in the form of a haploid egg or sperm. So they will only contain one chromosome in the of the entire set, one chromosome per, you know, uh, copy for the entire set and not the diploid version like they had in the somatic cells or in the original cells. Now these two when come, they come together and fertilization happens lead to a diploid zygote that has a maternal homologue and a paternal homologue. Now remember their original chromosomes may be identical or may be different many times obviously there will be differences throughout that chromosome so they are only getting one of the or the other and that all obviously allows for some of the variation that you see in the organisms. So now you have a diploid zygote, which then will undergo many, many, many rounds of mitosis to give rise to the genetically unique diploid organism uh, that you will have at the end of the day. So in a human gamete, you have 23 chromosomes, 
and in a human diploid cell or a somatic cell or a germline cell, you will have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosomes. Okay, so there's a distinct difference between a germline cell and a somatic cell that uh, so that they can carry their individual functions. A diploid parent has is composed of all these cells. Some of them are cells that make up the entire body and they do all the functions that the body needs to do. They make up all the organ systems. They may do all the work that needs to be done during development, during just everyday living. And these cells are what you'd call your somatic cells. And then in their sexual organs, they usually have their germline cells, which give rise to the actual gametes that make up the final progeny at the end of the day. Um, so only these diploid germline cells are going to be giving rise to the haploid gametes that are going to be making the new progeny, the new generation. And none of these somatic cells, any mutations that happen there, any changes that happen there, anything that goes on in these cells do not contribute at the end of the day to the final um, organism that is formed, final progeny, the offsprings that arise from these parents. So these haploid um, eggs and sperm obviously will be fertilized, uh, you know, lead to fertilization, give you that diploid zygote, and then the resulting organism will also be composed of a bunch of cells that are going to be making up it, its body structure and function, and that's going to be the somatic cells, and then they will have their own little pocket of germline cells that will give rise to their progeny in the future. So the somatic cells which are the gray cells in these images, are not going to be part of the sexual reproduction at all. Now, um, to do that, to do this process of gamete formation, um, the cells use meiosis specifically. So those are your germline nuclei. That's the ones that are going to undergo meiosis in order to give rise to haploid gametes. The remaining body cells, all the other somatic cells primarily, they are just going to be doing mitoses to make more copies of themselves in order to keep propagating the system to keep their job done. You know, whatever job it is that they do, keep that job rolling, keep the ball rolling on that. So mitoses, you start off with a diploid nucleus. After the cell is committed to cell cycle for whatever reason, maybe there's an injury, maybe there is old age and new cells need to replace them, whatever the reason may be, maybe there's a growth hormone that is triggering this um, process, they will um, go into the synthesis phase of cell cycle where they will duplicate the chromosomes rep through DNA replication and you will have now a quadruplied or 4N cell. That simply means that now there are four copies of each one of the chromosomes or each one of the genes inside those chromosomes and then in the process of mitosis you will end up with two diploid cells as a result these will be identical to the original cells overall minus any mutations or changes that may have happened due to environmental um, effect or uh, through its interactions inside any mistakes that may have happened and not been fixed in meiosis, this is going to be your diploid germline nuclei, so the germline cells only, not the somatic cells. Once they are committed, now not all of them are going to start doing this at the same time. Only some of them are going to do this at any given time. And those cells that are now triggered to go into this division, those cells are going to go through the same process of chromosome duplication through DNA replication, leading to a quadruplied cell. This quadruplied cell will go through two consecutive divisions in meiosis 1 and 2. The first one, meiosis 1, is the reductional division where the chromosomes, the actual homologous pairs of chromosomes will separate, leading to two cells that have 2N DNA content instead of the original 4N. Importantly, these now only have one or the other homolog for any given chromosome leading to genetic diversity at the first step. And then in meiosis 2, each one of these is going to do essentially a mitosis type division, where now you have four haploid nuclei as a result of this division. So meiosis generates four non-identical uh, haploid cells, while mitosis has, uh, gives rise to two identical diploid cells. 
So you start off with the diploid cell in both. This is a somatic cell. In this case, this is a germline cell. And through the process of meiosis, you're going to end up with non-identical four haploid gametes or haploid cells. And then in mitosis, the diploid cell will go through the process and lead to two genetically identical diploid cells. Now let's see where exactly um, these chromosomes separate and how exactly that happens. So in mitosis, the chromosomes line up individually, regardless of whether, you know, they don't get together with their homologs. They just line up all one at a time at the metaphase plate. So they are all uh, stacked on there at that center metaphase plate independently of each other. They don't have to be in a particular order. They will just be in whatever order they need to be. They are all going to be connected to the kinetochore microtubules. And at the end of mitosis, the sister chromatids are what's going to be separating. On the other hand, in meiosis, the maternal and the paternal chromosomal, uh, chromosomes get together. The homologous chromosome pairs get together and are um, joined together at the metaphase plate. Again, they don't have to be where all the maternal are on the right side and all the paternal. They can be either way. That's completely independent in each case. But the two homologous chromosome pairs are going to be together. That will mean that when the in meiosis 1, the chromosomes separate, it's the homologous chromosome pairs that separate. So one, the paternal 1 in this case, paternal 1 and the maternal 2 will go to one egg and maternal 1 and paternal 2 will go to the second egg. And that is, again, going to give rise to a certain amount of genetic variation. So next, looking at this joint function, right? So this um, particular structure that forms is very important in maintaining its integrity and in maintaining the way these chromosomes separate. So the duplicate paternal chromosomes and the duplicate maternal chromosome are joined together at the centromere. These individual arms, uh, you know, uh, duplicated chromosomes are called sister chromatids when they're joined at that centromere. This involves helper proteins that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. Um, and when they line up during meiosis, they are going to be joined also with each other. So the, in one of the arms, the inner arm of the maternal and the paternal chromosomes are also going to be interacting with each other using specific proteins that, again, we will talk about in just a minute. Now, these non-sister chromatids that are interacting with each other are going to also uh, introduce a second level of um, genetic variability as they will swap segments of DNA in a process called crossing over. And this structure, when it is built, where these two, the maternal and the paternal chromosome, are joined together is called a bivalent. So looking at these bivalent chromosome structures and the process of crossing over or swapping that material. It's only going to happen in the inner arm, which is the arms that are interacting with each other. And you will have these points where you will see this kind of cross structure. This is called chiasma. And this is where genetic information is going to be swapped between the maternal and the paternal chromosome, uh, leading to um, more diversified genetic information. So there's going to be a little bit of mix and match between the paternal and maternal homologs in these inner arms, while the outer arms will still remain completely paternal or completely maternal. Here is an electron micrograph of one of these chromosomes, and you can see multiple sites of chiasma on this single chromosome. Um, and here it is again showing it in another way. So let's look at this process a little bit <laughs> in detail. Uh, the process starts out with the formation of the bivalent chromosomes and then um, the process is going, you know, the, those bivalent chromosomes are going to have uh, start interacting with each other in those inner arms. And those inner arms, the first thing that will happen is that there will be protein complexes that will produce a double strand break in the DNA of one of these chromatids. Now, it, it doesn't matter whether it's the paternal or maternal, they're both equally likely to get the break, but one of them only, only one of them at a time is going to be broken. So here, if you take these two inner arms, one from the paternal and one from the maternal side, and expand it and look at it closely, 
This is the double-stranded DNA of the maternal arm. This is the double-stranded DNA of the paternal arm. These are the five prime to three prime, you know, orientation, just like we always have. These are the double helices. The double strand break proteins are going to break just one of those two strands, either the maternal or the paternal. Doesn't matter which one, it can be either one. Both are equally likely to be subjected to this. But only one will get broken in any given instance. And then nucleases will digest parts of those um, ends from the five prime end, starting at the five prime end, leading to these sticky ends, these overhangs that have that are single stranded at this point. Now those single stranded structures will obviously need to be fixed, and that material has to be um, reintroduced into it. It won't just get re, you know, it won't just copy the complementary base pairs from the other strand. Instead, it is going to have a strand exchange where these double stranded structure with their sticky ends are going to interact with the paternal homologous side of it, the complementary side on the homologous um, paternal chromatid. And that's where it's going to be using it as a template to fill the gap. So obviously that requires DNA synthesis, same enzymes that we talked about in DNA synthesis, again, and more importantly in DNA double strand repair are going to be the one that will work here. And they are going to um, capture that second strand and then go ahead and fill the gap in with the nucleotides, appropriate nucleotides using this paternal one as a template. Similarly, over here as well, it's going to use the um, paternal one as a template and fill in the gaps. So now you have a structure where you have um, both of them kind of crossed over, filled up, all of that stuff is complete except there are these nicks, the double strand breaks that were introduced and those need to be fixed up. They are going to be fixed up by DNA ligase just like before. And then um, that structure is going to be resolved when the strands separate, when uh, meiosis one finishes, uh, as the meiosis one finishes in anaphase, uh, as they separate out from each other. So the proteins uh, promote the formation of this cross strand exchange with the undamaged chromatid, which will be the one that did not get broken. And then once it is resolved, then each chromatid is going to contain a segment of DNA from the original and a segment of DNA from the um, opposite, the, you know, the other strand. Many of these steps resemble exactly what a double T a strand DNA, a DNA break will look like, a repair of double strand break in somatic cells. Okay, so let's look at the proteins that are involved in this process. Um, these proteins can are also termed synaptonymal complex, and they help to align these uh, non-homologous duplicated, or these homologous rather, duplicated pairs of chromosome. So looking at these chromosomes individually, again, at a molecular level, you have the two uh, strands right here. These are sister chromatids of the duplicated maternal, and these are sister chromatids of the duplicated paternal homologs, same chromosome, say chromosome one. Um, so the dark red and the light red, they are the two sister chromatids on the maternal side. The dark blue and light blue are the on the uh, paternal side. These are joined together, the sister chromatids themselves, right? Because they have to be together too. They are joined together by these protein complexes known as cohesin. And it's easy to remember because cohesive, cohesion, right? They join them together. And these cohesins are attached to these axial core proteins that are kind of acting as a band to hold this structure together. Next, individually, now these chromosomes are uh, together with their sister chromatids, right? On either side, but they also have to interact with each other. So those inner arms, as we talked about, one of those chromatids interacting with each other happens through another protein uh, that's called transverse filaments. And these transverse filaments form kind of like a zipper-like structure, uh, and they pull these two uh, sister chromatids together so that they can be held together in this interaction. This entire complex now, this whole structure is known as that synaptonymal complex. 
So it has at least three major protein structures that you should know about, the axial core proteins um, that are that everything is attached to, cohesin that are holding the sister chromatids together, and then the transverse filaments that are keeping the two homologs together. Sorry. So here you can see a, a fluorescent micrograph of a human oocyte. So these are eggs that are going to, you know, it will lead to the production of eggs or mature egg. Um, and so in this oocyte, as the process gets started, you see the red is showing you the chromosomes as bivalent. So these are already duplicated. They're already, the homologous chromosomes are already next to each other. They're already joined in this structure so that now what you're looking at are those four, um, you know, sister chromatids, essentially two sister chromatids on the maternal and the paternal joined together as a bivalent. So that's why they're thick enough to be seen a little bit better visually. Um, so these are the four sister chromatids joined together. The greens are the sites of crossing over and the blues are your centromeres. So each one of these long strands, each one of these chromosomes will only have one centromere, but they have multiple sites of crossing over. And that's important. That It's not like there's only one place for this exchange to occur. The exchange can occur in multiple spaces multiple places on the same chromosome so you can have multiple sites of um, gene swapping thus leading to more and more diversification of that uh, process. That's why it's hard to get two kids to look alike even with the same parents. So how this structure stays um, kind of good and the integrity of it is dependent upon the synaptonymal complex and also the chiasmata. So these chiasmas, these crossover points that are happening, they are going to allow for proper segregation of these homologous the chromosomes in the first meiotic division because they will kind of keep them together and stop them from running around here and there. And then your kinetochores obviously on the two sister chromatids are going to function as a single unit so they can, as they pull them apart, they are going to pull the homologous chromosomes apart in that set. Um, the cohesins at this stage keep these the structure the way it is. They keep the sister chromatids glued together to each other along the entire length of this, um, you know, maternal and the paternal side. However, in anaphase, you're going to have a rapid um, degradation of the cohesins that will allow for them to start separating and moving away. And that's important for it to start separating and get um, to their opposite sides, to their individual poles. So the kinetic cores of the sister chromatids, they kind of work together as well. They work at the same rate, same time to pull them apart. And that's important so that they can be properly segregated and move to the opposite side. So there are two kinds of genetic reassortment that is happening in this process, and that's important to remember. It's not just one level of genetic diversity, it's multiple. The first independent assortment of indep the maternal and the paternal chromosomes themselves. So because we are looking at these diploid uh, chromosomes or diploid um, organisms, in diploid organisms, uh, the amount of diversity that can happen, the number of possible gametes that can happen just on the basis of number of chromosomes would be 2 to the n um, during meiosis as they develop these haploid gametes because the maternal and paternal uh, chromosomes are under no obligation to all be on the same side or either side. They can be wherever they need to be and that means that in meiosis too, in this case for example, you had three homologous chromosomes, and then you had several different possible gametes that could happen from that one um, starting point, right? So in this case, it shows you eight different possibilities that could happen as gametes as a result of these three homologous pairs. And so the more you have, the more uh, the more chromosomes you have, the more diversity you can get in the uh, possibilities you have for the possible gametes that you can get. The second level of genetic reassortment and introduction of more diversity is at the level of individual chromosomes as they cross over in meiosis one. 
So in your homologous chromosomes, you have areas of swapping this genetic material. The more exchanges that happen, the more diversity is going to be there, obviously. And so in meiotic cell division, in the first part, you're going to have this crossover and you will have areas swapped. And so that even with a single chromosome, you end up, you know, just a single homologous chromosome pair, you can end up with four individual gametes. So again, the more you have, the more diversity you can get. That leads to eons possibilities as far as humans are concerned with their 23 pairs of chromosome. Now, obviously, anytime anything big like this, any rearrangement is happening, there's a possibility of damage and there's a possibility that things can go wrong. So things can go wrong both at the level of first reassortment or the second reassortment. At the level of first reassortment, it would be the chromosome segregation during meiosis. Uh, so you can have meiosis happen incorrectly for one or more of the chromosome homologs so that, um, you know, maybe in meiotic one, the two homologs don't separate and both, um, you know, sets are given to one while the other one is aneuploid and has nothing in it for that one chromosome. That is called non-disjunction during meiotic cell division one. And that would lead to two aneuploid gametes with two copies of chromosome 21 and two aneuploid gametes with no copies of chromosome 21. And obviously that's going to be a problem in both cases. Similarly, you can also have a condition where things go fine in the first set. You still have them separated correctly, but then in the second division, you have this non-disjunction and one of the cells get both copies, of the entire chromosome, rather than the sister chromatids separating properly. Either one of those is a possibility and normally leads to deleterious effects down the road. So a lot of these were understood using, um, you know, all these rules and um, all this process has been understood first at a phenotypic level and then we have gone back and tried to figure out the genetic basis of this inheritance. And a lot of those were based on Mendel's experiments with peas and pea plants and the individual characteristics that he studied. So for today, I'm going to stop at this point and um, then give you a second lecture where I discuss more in detail how Mendel's experiments helped us understand this process at a macro level, at the level of the phenotype, visually what we were looking at, and then what was done to understand the backstory and understand how individual genes affect this process or which proteins are important and whatnot. Um, but as we end this first part, just an interesting tidbit. For the longest time, people thought that the sperms were the only reason responsible for, only source responsible for what you look like and all the genetic information that was contained down to the point that there were drawings where they thought they could see a little tiny human or organism inside the sperm head. Now we know that um, that's not true and instead both the egg and the sperm have to contribute to that final organism um, for it to be functioning properly, for it to be developing properly. So um, I'll post the second part in another lecture. Hope you enjoyed this. Take care. Bye.